pivotal moment of my clinical career was when um, a neurosurgeon actually was talking to me and said quite accidentally be prepared to change horses and um, it was round about November and I think it might have been the Melbourne Cup week and we were talking about all sorts of things and um, he he said that life is about horses for courses and sometimes you actually have to change that and that became somewhat important for me because um, up until the time that he and I were having that conversation I had set myself up to do head and neck surgery and I had everything lined up including supporters and referees and that was the direction and he said that to me and for some reason it stuck in my mind although it bore no relevance to the conversations I had been having with him. And about a week or so later, <clears throat> Brendan Dooley, then head of department of orthopedics, came up to me and said, well, if you're interested in doing orthopedics, we would support you. And so I said, sure. And the rest is history. I was um, a consultant um, maybe three years in the game back in Australia, I was tackling a really, really big case. It was an osteosarcoma of the sacrum and the SI joint that had crossed the midline. So surgery that I would need to perform would mean crossing the midline of the sacrum, coming all the way up to the L5-S1 junction, resecting the pelvis and sciatic nerve and everything with it and uh, we started at 7 30 in the morning and it was about six or seven o'clock in the evening now and it was tough and it was bleeding and um, it, it was really challenging and i stopped for a moment and thought to myself if not for me who would be doing this how could they have done this in the past what have i run into trouble now who's actually going to help me and the answer came back was nobody, actually, because I had created a clinical situation that very few people would have ever seen. But I actually had trained in this with some of the best in the world. And so I had to work out what to do. And I had to learn from that, that preparation is everything. And that it's by no mistake that we find ourselves where we find ourselves, whether it's good or bad. And uh, it, it was an interesting case because I did that resection and at 10 o'clock I refinished. And the next day I went down to intensive care and I had promised her that after resecting her entire cytic nerve, including the lumbosacral plexus and the nerve at the notch, as I took the sacrum and the ilium, that she would, no, she would have no function of her right lower leg. And I said to her, I looked her in the face and I said to her, move your leg. And she moved her leg. And she did not have a foot drop or anything. And I found that the most astounding moment of my life because I had, with the registrar observing, officially cut the side of the nerve. But there must have been some, some, trans-pelvic connection or something because I cannot understand and I've seen her since and she went on to have a number of babies and she continues to walk normally with her foot um, how she has a normal functioning sciatic nerve I have no idea um, what did I learned from that case that to to do incredible things in surgery or to go down the path of of surgery which is going to be challenge we have to be prepared to accept the challenge and to accept the challenge you've got to be prepared for the challenge and that means you need to train and think and work and study all about what you do so that you know more than anyone else you know more than anyone else about that area so you avoid the problems that you might face and certainly since that time the whole technique of pelvic surgery for me personally has changed with the, the appropriate use of teams, the appropriate use of machinery, technology, such that it is now far safer than it was when I first operated on such a patient a 
quarter of a century ago. You know, and, and that teaching is really what people before me would have understood and after me will understand is that to be good at anything, you've got to work at it. But to do that, you have to accept the challenges that you know it will present. My main, I've got a number of foci, you could say, but they all seem to, uh, th there is a focus on self-improvement outside self. And I guess in many respects, it reflects the sort of person I am. I want to be better at what I do. I want to be a better partner. What does that mean? I want to be a better father. What does that mean? I want to be a better person. What does that mean? I want to be a better community person. And I want to be better at what I do every day too. And so a lot of, a lot of my interests outside would revolve around those things that I hope by reflecting on do make me better. And I'm not sure if they do or not. So it's about focusing in the little times that I have about being, how, how, how is it to be a better partner for my wife? How is it to be a better father for my four girls who are just the most wonderful, liberated women, self-taught, self-thinking, great initiative and motivation, you know? Um, to be a community-spirited person by giving back to the community in different ways, whether it's sitting on the school board, whether it is being part of a consumer advocacy group, um, whether it's giving time to help local sports clubs on weekends, you know, do certain things for them. Um, from time to time, I, I contribute my time to <clears throat> the Wandon International Horse Trials, just shuffling paper for them or being a scribe for a judge, you know, a menial task, but it's just one way of giving back and learning, interacting, understanding the world outside mine. Is it? Then, of course, in terms of technically self-improvement, because as a surgeon, we're all driven. I, I really enjoy doing things that challenge me physically. For example, going to the gym and you get challenged a lot. If you've got a personal trainer hounding you from behind, telling you, you know, you need to be doing a lot better than what you're doing. <laughs> um, or fly fishing, you know, the challenge of raising a trout, surly trout from the, the bottom of a river to take your fly against a headwind on a choppy river. Um, or riding a horse, 750 kilogram beast has got a mind of its own to do exactly what you would like it to do without even appearing that you're asking it to do anything. So those are challenges that are personal challenges, <clears throat> but what it has taught me is a deeper respect for the world around me, the respect of the laws of the environment, the laws of society, the laws of animal kingdom, you know, and how does that work? <clears throat> you have to respect a horse to get a horse to do what you want it to do. You can't make it do anything. You have to ask it, and you have to ask it the right way, you know, and, and it, it, if, if animals respond so well to respect, that's one thing it taught me about a horse. It's actually taught me so much about myself and a better person, how a better person I could be, you know, taking that into consideration. And I hope I've been a better person since learning how to deal with these animals. You know. So th those are the things that uh, take my time. perceive what's best for the patient and I wonder at times whether we understand what patients value the most about their condition about their situation about the treatment we're going to give them and the outcomes to expect and because a lot of what we do works we just do it almost mindlessly you know painful hip x-ray with arthritis you need a hip replacement maybe not everyone needs a hip replacement 
why why don't people who have the best hip replacement have the best results? It's perfect. You look at the X-ray; it's perfect, and yet they're not happy. For example, you know. And so, I think value-based care really revolves around delivery of quality care, and its value is the maximum quality for the best cost. Right? And just just reducing cost doesn't improve quality. But improving quality can minimize costs because what you're doing is you're improving the processes and getting rid of inefficiencies, ineffectiveness. You're divesting from practices that simply don't work, and you're trying to give the best outcome to patients based upon what they want, what they expect, and also what the evidence says. And, and as surgeons who are very practical and who do things that work from a very technical perspective. I think we we have to make that sophisticated and mature, mature step now towards understanding what patients value and take that into consideration. And I think surgeons, by and large, a large appreciate that. And and it's really a, a question of developing a culture that sustains that. Uh, that is a challenge because um, medicine is well paid. Medicine is lucrative, and sometimes we do it because we are well paid, and it is lucrative. And that's the honest truth, you know. Let's let's not be um, naive about that. Um, but that said, I'm really heartened by the way the whole orthopedic community is rising now and looking at data. For example, the joint replacement registry data, and, and focusing on the outcomes, and, and that sets itself well to really um, take on the challenge of developing new strategies for care that are values based. My favorite movie is The Batman, The Dark Knight Rises, and why? Because there's one scene in it where um, this mad guy, I don't know, uh, sorry, Ra's al Ghul is about to put all the dangerous potions in the sewers of Gotham City. And um, when it mixes with the water, the poison turns into a hallucinogenic drug that affects people. They run off as this morbid mob. And there's the Batman. And he's about to dive into the darkness and save the world. And he turns to um, the reporter there and he says, it's not what you do. It's not who you are behind the mask, but what you do that defines you. And and that actually says a lot to me as surgeons. It's not who you are behind that mask, but actually what you do that will define you. And I have always fancied that. <laughs>